It all starts with a day called Ash Wednesday. Derived from the Latin phrase diestinarum, it means day of ashes. Per Catholic custom, on this day, a cross is marked on the believer's forehead in ashes, symbolizing one's belief in Christ. This marks the physical and spiritual beginning of the Lenten season. And it's the 17th day of Lent, and it's a time when many Christians give up something as a sacrifice for what they see as the true spirit of the season. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Jamaica Magazine. I am your host, Audrey Williams. And today, I'm at Webster Memorial United Church, where I am spending time in reflection for all that has been done for me. Here's a piece of advice. Every day, take time to stop and think about all that you have and give thanks. Take time to express gratitude. And coming up in today's show, we're going to give you a fresh perspective on what you need in the workforce. All this and more after the news, so don't go anywhere. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your JIS News for Friday, March 1, 2024. The final count of ballots in all electoral divisions for the local government election has now been completed. The results indicate that the Jamaica Labour Party, JLP, candidates have won the majority of the seats in seven parishes. St. Thomas, Portland, St. Anne, Trelawney, St. James, St. Elizabeth, and Clarendon. The People's National Party, PNP, meanwhile, has won five. St. Mary, Hanover, Westmoreland, Manchester, and St. Catherine. The PNP also won the majority of the divisions and the position of mayor for the municipality of Portmore. The Electoral Office reports that Kingston and St. Andrew ended in a tie, with the PNP and the JLP winning 20 divisional seats each. Government has allocated funds for the construction of revetments in Buff Bay, Portland and Anata Bay, St. Mary to protect the coastal towns from storm surges. The work will be done under the Enhancing the Resilience of the Agricultural Sector and Coastal Areas project. $441.5 million is budgeted in the 2024-2025 estimates of expenditure for the project. It is intended to strengthen coastal protection, improve land and water management for the agricultural sector, and build institutional capacity against climate change risks. The targets for the upcoming fiscal year include the installation of 118 meters of revetment at Buff Bay Site 2 and 300 meters at Notta Bay Site 5. The project commenced in October 2012 and is slated to conclude in June 2025 after seven periods of extension. It is jointly funded by the Government of Jamaica and the Adaptation Fund. Another major allocation in the new national budget is $3.3 billion earmarked for interventions to combat preventable illnesses. This money is allocated for the Ministry of Health's Prevention and Care Management of Non-Communicable Diseases, NCDs, project. The amount provided in the 2024-2025 estimates of expenditure will target activities such as the organization and consolidation of the integrated health services networks. It will also cover anticipated expenditure on construction work to redevelop the Spanish Town Hospital, as well as the San Diego Park, Greater Port Moore, and Old Harbor Health Centers. Other anticipated targets include completing relocation activities at the Maypen and St. Anne's Bay Hospitals, St. Anne's Bay Health Center, and Brownstown Health Center. The money will also facilitate the procurement of dental imaging equipment for the St. Jago, Greater Port Moore, and St. Anne's Bay Health Centers. Spending from this allocation is also available to complete implementation of electronic health records in 12 facilities and start the 4th Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey. It will also fund the approval of a manual on chronic care model pathway and a policy framework for patient self-management. Labor and Social Security Minister Pernell Charles Jr. has welcomed funding in the amount of $5.7 million from the Canadian High Commission. The money is to assist persons living with disabilities. The minister gave an update during the recent closing out ceremony for the strategic engagement of rural women with disabilities in Sustainable Farming Techniques Project. 
The Abilities Foundation and Canada Fund for Local Initiatives has partnered to execute this project where 50 persons have been trained and their lives transformed. We hope and urge you to continue to aim for success and to utilize your training not just for personal gain, but we expect that you will bring innovation and value to your community and to the agricultural sector in Jamaica. Minister Charles Jr. assured the participants that they had the government's full support, adding that every avenue for employment was open to them and all persons with disabilities. The 25 persons who participated in the second batch of the Sustainable Farming Project also received certificates and starter kits during the ceremony. And finally, a Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, WCJF facility for teenage mothers, is to be established in St. Catherine. Minister of Gender Olivia Grange made the announcement on Wednesday during the handing over ceremony for a wellness bench at the foundation's office in Kingston. It was donated by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. She says establishing a teen centre in St. Catherine is critical as the foundation continues work to ensure that young women in that part of the island are able to access its services. St. Catherine is one of the fastest growing parishes in relation to population. One of the fastest growing in Jamaica. So today I'm announcing that we will be establishing another main center in the parish of St. Catherine to treat with the needs of our teenage mothers. The Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation is currently providing assistance to approximately 500 adolescent mothers across the island. One of its priority engagements, the Program for Adolescent Mothers, is aimed at assisting pregnant girls, 17 and under, to continue their secondary education. Under the program, girls who have dropped out of school due to pregnancy are allowed to continue their education at the nearest WCJF centers for at least one term and are subsequently returned to the formal school system after the birth of their babies. This center is among the most important organization in Jamaica, operating in the interests of our young women, in particular, a number of our girls whose advance was paused by teenage pregnancy. We are proud of the record of assistance by the center, which has resulted in successful young women. For the last decade, the rate of repeat pregnancy remains below 2%. It means that the center is doing something good. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. all creators join the JIS Creators Challenge. We want to see your unique perspective on why you love Jamaica. Whether it's through a Jamaican adventure, arts and craftsmanship, or Jamaican cuisine. Or party lifestyle, or a celebration of our Ota Maniwan people, culture. Unleash your creativity in a video one minute or less, showcasing why you love Jamaica. Upload your video to your socials and tag JIS by March 8th. Follow us on all our platforms for more info on how to enter and prizes to be won. Stay tuned! One thing you can be sure to give up this Lenten season is your expectations of others, particularly in the workplace. More on that in our upcoming series, He Says, She Says. Take a look. The workplace dynamic can be a bit tricky but maybe if we should get a strong grasp on the do's and the don'ts we just might be able to increase our comfort level while being productive it's time for another he says she says conversation joining us today are reverend david grant 
the lead pastor of the Jamaica Evangelistic Center and the founder and CEO of Odigia Global, a leadership and personal development organization. Ms. Geraldine Garwood, a clinical psychologist, behavior analyst, and adult educator, and the founder of Behavior Change Consulting Services, and business owner at Dermy Mitchell. Welcome to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Our guests are here to provide some perspectives on everyday life situations we all want to talk about. Today, that's acceptable behavior in the workplace. I'm your host, Andre Palmer. Let's get right into it. Jamaica business culture is straightforward. It is centered around mutual respect, courtesy, and hard work, and you must dress for the job. But workplace indecency is a prevailing issue, as some employees have reported incidences of sexual harassment and discrimination. What could be the root cause of this? Well, we will break it down here. Some of the factors that may contribute to the incidences in the workplace is that of when persons work hard and they need to be promoted, sometimes that promotion comes with favors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if the favor is not being granted, then the person cannot receive a promotion. And we, a lot of females tend to report that in some organizations that they would have been at a company for a period of time. They would have done all that is required. They would have exceeded the target given to them. And a lot of openings um, at the upper level is made available. But because they are under pressure to give in to sexual favors um, from a supervisor or a manager or somebody in a senior authority, then they experience what we would call discrimination. Right? Another thing that may happen is persons in the workplace who do not speak the Queen's English, mm -hmm. standard English, and, mm -hmm. and that has come to the fore too. So they will experience marginalization, I would rather say, because they may be from a certain strata of society and they may not be able to kind of represent themselves the way how the company probably would want them to. Right, but and their background now plays into that, and they are also marginalized or what you would say experience some level of discrimination. Right, so a number of things can happen for persons experience discrimination and sexual harassment, and how it is handled is very um, critical to any development of any institution. But couldn't that cause like? affect the whole morale of the person like you are qualified for the job you know the job inside out you really like working for the company but because of one little issue you cannot get the work would that would that cause some level of discouragement among not only the staff that is that is that has been uh, marginalized but other persons seeing that if you have a little issue you will not be chosen even if you're qualified Yes, I, I, I do believe so, because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen, and um, we have to remember that we're always in community. No matter how we try to isolate ourselves, mm -hmm. we're always in community. So that one particular person who has been marginalized will share with her co their co-workers, mm -hmm. you know, and then it goes around, because if it's a, a female who feels marginalized, she's going to share with her female co-workers, probably even with her male co-workers too. But what the females are going to start to look within themselves and say, but, you know, but this is unfair. This is unfair. They now might drop their standard of work as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or one or two might improve their standard of work and be willing to offer. Mm. Adermi, as a business owner, my question to you is, would that affect your staff turnover, say a, one of your employees are there for a long time, but they are look, overlooked, uh, how would that affect you as a business owner, knowing that this, this may lead to the person leaving? Ah, that's, that's in, that, in that scenario, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of it's hard because then you, you kind of, you don't want to just replace somebody that, is, that, is, that has been there with somebody, create somebody new, because then it's going to be hard on the business per se, because you're going to have to train them, um, coach them um, about the position and such forth. But mm -hmm. in terms of 
the, the, the harassment part of things in the workplace. Um, I've seen it happen um, before where, where the guy is basically flirting with another co-worker, right? Instigating certain things to that co-worker, right? And I know it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not it's, none of it is, is, is right, but you, you tend to have that within any workplace or any organization where somebody is always trying to instigate something with someone. But as you mentioned about the whole sexual harassment and seeing it in the workplace, mm -hmm. how does that affect the work environment when that is frequent, even though it's, it, sometimes it may not seem obvious? But how do you think it affects the whole entire work environment? It can make the environment become hostile and it can also make it become very timid. So some persons be, can be afraid because it depends on the level you're at and how you value yourself. Some person will take the harassment because they have to think about their children to feed, the bills to pay, the rent, I mean utility bills, and so they can't really lose this job. Mm. So they will take the harassment, you know, and it makes them uncomfortable because it impacts them now mentally. They are not able to sleep. They are not eating well. You know, they, are, they go to work with that level of anxiety, that fear that this is going to happen. On the other hand, though, you have some persons that can become volatile. And the person who is doing the harassment can end up losing their life. My question that I want to ask now, do you think the age group of persons entering the workforce matter and how they adapt? Why or why not? Can I take this one? Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, does, it does matter because the, how the age range plays is that uh, some people are not fully mature. Mm -hmm. So they come into the workplace, in the work environment, with, with immature behavior, which leads to certain actions or certain things done. I want to say also that I think that we should prepare the younger generation for work. And they should be prepared from the high school level. So when they're at mm -hmm. fifth form, fourth form, fifth form, going on to sixth form for those who go to sixth form. Because we are realizing now that a number of our youngsters may not have the finances to go straight to college. So they would want to work first and save their money and help themselves back to school. And which is good. Right, they are trying to show some sense of autonomy and they are trying to assist their parents who may not be able to um, sustain them for a college education. But I really think that at the high school level, they should be prepared for the workforce. You mentioned immaturity and in terms of the age. How can persons avoid conflict at work and build better relationships? And as you, you mentioned earlier about being better prepared, and the need for that. How can one avoid these conflicts and better build healthy relationships on the job? Uh, if I may, um, the culture of that business, the culture of that workplace is very important. And the leaders are the bosses, are the ones who really set the culture. One of the things that is very important is clear and mm. precise communication. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are important, right? So persons need to know that hey, I can go this far in a conversation with this person and no further. It's about also learning or being emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know, where you see someone probably looking depressed or the, how you approach them, the things you say to them can be either helpful or offensive. So it's a whole matter. I, I believe, I, and I'm saying this now, that I believe some workplaces need to bring in persons like the goodly Miss Garwood here to come in and to do some training, do some educating as to how you operate within the workspace. Because the workspace is different from home. It's different from school. Mm -hmm. It's different from even church. All right, so we went to the streets to hear what the viewers had to say on the same topic that we're discussing right here. Let's take a look. Female make better leaders now. In the past it was males, but we find out that ladies are um, developing um, in, in, in disciplinary issues. They, they are able to, they are powerful women who have um, 
excel in their in their area or whatever their field may be. And because of that, I think that they make good leaders. I wait the you get set up. So them family have to keep regular set up. Well, this is where we have to end our discussion with our he says, she says conversation. Stay tuned for more. Our guests were Reverend David Grant, Miss Geraldine Garwood, and Adermi Mitchell. Thank you for watching, and I am Andre Palmer. Take care. That leadership that depends upon another race is a leadership that will enslave. Yes. Any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that will enslave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Public passenger vehicle operators and commercial carriers. Renew your road license online. It's as easy as one, two click. Visit the Transport Authority website at www.ta.org.jm. Choose your license type and click apply now. Sign in or create an account with your email address and complete the application process uploading all relevant documents. Make payment using a debit or credit card. Once your application is approved, the Transport Authority will email you to collect your sticker. Pick up your sticker in office or utilize our courier service. Once the sticker is collected, your digital road license will be emailed to you. For more information, call the Transport Authority toll free at 888-991-5687. Although we celebrate Jamaica every day, there is one special day when we draw attention to our accomplishments, embrace our identity, and teach the next generation about our traditions. This year it was done under one theme, Celebrating Jamaica, authentic and unique, a favorite trend at Dweet. Jamaica brand is that we are known worldwide and there are Jamaicans at heart persons who have no Jamaican blood in their veins but when they look in the mirror they see green gold and black running through their veins and they identify with us as, as Jamaicans because of our culture because of our value because of our love for each other because of, of the beauty of our country. We may love a lion heart. We may love a lion heart. Strong and everlasting. What is you? We may love will never part. We may love will never part. Strong and everlasting. Only for you. Only for you. Only for you. Me not joke. This is a problem for your pagan or foreign, you start follow your friend. If your power ain't there, yeah, you get be a boxing. Then you call the police, call it abusing. Mommy, what make you not allow me? You attack on my steer when I do grow me. You know, hard me off the walk. Mommy, shut up. And you my daddy less. When you attack about little girl, sit down, let me tell you something. Your father left because I better life him off the break.
You see, what has happened is that, uh, you know, over the years, we have developed this idea that somehow procurement is only about one thing, which is, I mentioned it before, catching the, the bad guys and making sure that your name never gets called up for doing anything wrong. Now, a journalist can say that they've never breached any ethic if they've never published a story. You can say you never killed anybody with a car if you never left your house. You can't live your life and make the constraint the primary thing. You never get anywhere. Public procurement, unfortunately, has found itself in a space where creativity and good business sense are constrained by a need to show that you're not corrupt and not being bad and being called up for misfeasance. So there's a lot of flexibility that I think people can unlock as they become clearer and, and deeper in understanding of what the function really entails. And, and with unlocking all of that potential, they can identify opportunities to ensure that the needs of their clients are met. So instead of showing the reasons that something cannot work, which is what most procurement practitioners are want to do, the, proc the procurement practitioner that truly understands the function is able to identify, even within the four corners of the law, the, the, the available areas that will allow them to suit all the needs of the client. So they, they can understand the market better, they can ask the client better questions, and therefore deliver overall better value to the client. There's, there are times when the client knows way more than, than you as the practitioner. And you have to listen to the client when the client says, you're telling me to do this broad competition and there's nobody to compete in this because there's literally only one supply in the market. Well, there's nothing wrong with making that decision as long as you can back it with logic and evidence. People are going to value you because you are now able to make the system work in the way it's intended. Not, not to keep things away and keep development away and keep us from getting into contract, but rather to enable the work of the entity. Public procurement is not about catching bad guys. It's about getting government's business done. And we've come to the end of our program. Get a recap of everything you saw here and more on our website, jis.gov.jm. I'm Audrey Williams. Shalom. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.